Are we live? All right. Welcome, everyone, to the ARCA Racing Podcast. I'm your host, Colby Evans, a.k.a. Starting Parker here. And we got a, a weird different show for you guys today. It's just a review show today. No uh, previews as we're in the early stages of the ARCA 2024 season. So we haven't really hit the stage yet where we're doing um, review shows than preview shows. Uh, we're just doing a review uh, show today of the ARCA and ARCA West Series combo race at Phoenix, which unfortunately was cut short by rain. Um, so, yeah, the review might not be as long as it usually is due to the fact that we didn't get all of the racing in. But nonetheless, still plenty to talk about. Still lots to discuss in terms of the main series division and what's going to be going on in that championship battle and what we saw in this race. And, of course, the West Series. Was, this was their, um, you know, by technicality, their first race of the season. What's that championship going to look like? What can we expect in those fields this year? So, you know, it's nice that we have this big race to start the year. We also had DNQs again. Yes, hard to believe two straight ARCA races with DNQs. Who the heck would have predicted that? I don't know. I didn't myself, so I don't know if any of you had, but yeah. We're going to talk about all of it. Um, I'm going to go through my little intro. I'd go through at the beginning of every podcast, and we will jump right into uh, the action. So, yeah, you guys know the drill. Uh, as always, follow me on social media, starting Parker on Twitter. Uh, we're just getting close. To, we're just past 5,500 followers. So we're getting close to 6,000. Uh, go go uh, hit the follow there. We are less than 320 subscribers away from 2,000 subs here on YouTube. So he's, uh, please hit that subscribe button and turn on that bell for all notifications. Super chats are open if you'd like to send one. I'm going to support the podcast. That would be much appreciated. And, of course, check out TheRacingExperts.com for all NASCAR media-related content, the official media partner of this podcast. So, Phoenix Raceway. I've admitted many times on this podcast from people who watch my ARCA reviews, um, previews and reviews, and people who even watch my backmarker battle shows on Phoenix, it is definitely not one of my favorite tracks. I think it's uh, very boring. I don't think it provides really the best racing. I think the lack of horsepower that we have in every division holds it back. It's it, it's just not one of my favorite tracks in general. Even even if we had full horsepower in all these divisions, Phoenix is just not my favorite track. And you know it, the ARCA races there haven't been all that bad. And in fact, I would say that the ARCA race was probably probably on par with the Xfinity and Cup race. Honestly. All three races just didn't do it for me this weekend. I'll be honest with you. I'll, I'll go into it more on the NASCAR side when we talk about backmarker battles on Thursday. Uh, but, you know, to me, the, the, the ARCA race, mm, I don't know. I, you know, I'm, I'm honest with you guys. You know, when, when races are good and when races are bad and when races are really, really bad, I'm not going to lie, guys. I didn't really enjoy this one. Uh, this one at Phoenix with the ARCA series. And, you know, it's a shame. I hate saying that. I really do. But... I just, I gotta be honest, man. We had some good moments. We had some good battles. It was nice seeing, um, it was nice seeing the 18, the 20, I mean, we were always used to the 18 and 20 going at each other. Um, excuse me. Sorry there. We're always used to seeing the 18 and the 20 go at each other. Um, but of course, you know, at least we saw this time that they were battling. Like there wasn't one guy out in front, one guy, you know, like a second or two behind we actually saw the 18 and 20 battling with each other, but once again, the same old, same old, like we kind of saw last season, nobody can really match what that 18 and the 20 car bring in every week. And, you know, I'll admit, I don't know what to do to fix that because obviously we know the Joe Gibbs team, they're going to put a lot of, we know, we know William Sawalich has got and his guys uh, put a lot of money into that organization. So obviously they're going to bring the best of the best equipment every single week, even when they really don't have to some weeks. I don't know why, they bring this elite equipment to every single race. So some of these races, they just don't need to bring it to. Uh, but nonetheless, you know, that's just what you expect. And then Venturini, you know, I mean, obviously the, the flagship car of the program is the 20 car, just based off of the speed um, speed it has. And it's just so hard to beat those guys, man. It, no matter who is behind the wheel, man, it is so hard to beat that 18 and 20 weekly. And it does provide for some good battles, you know, with the 18 and the 20, but... You know, I'm not going to lie, guys. It definitely gets stale. It, it does get a little bit stale in those moments. I don't know if we're going to see that consistently this season. Um, but so far, first inklings are, yeah, we're going to be seeing it quite a bit. But it's not it's not the biggest problem, you know. It's not definitely not the big. There's more problems. Uh, there's more problems that could be worse than the 18 to 20, once again, battling it out. But like I said, guys, we had a 43-car entry list, a uh, stacked field. Uh, a lot of the entries uh, – 
from the main division. Uh, none of them really, a lot of them did carry from Daytona. Some of them, uh, obviously a lot did not. The West Series entries that did carry over the full-time ones like you would expect. We did have some random ones in there as well. You had like Grant Enfinger in a one-off entry for the Joe Farr team. Uh, you had Connor Mosek in there in a one-off for the Pinnacle team. Isaac Johnson, he's not full-time, but he's in another one-off race for Greg Van Alst. Um, well, let's see here. We also had John Armendia. This was kind of a random appearance by the Jeff Spraker team at a non-plate track. Um, I'm trying to find other examples in there in the chat. Uh, it looks like that was pretty much it in terms of random entries. If you look at the entry list, it's kind of who, you, like I said, we went over it last week, kind of who you would, you would expect for a main series and combo series race. Um, some notables, we did have Isabella Robusto in the race. So we had uh, quite a few women in the field. I believe it was Danica Dart. Um, I think she was only like 16. Um, I didn't know she was that young. Always cool to see uh, uh, more women in the sport, but I had no idea she was that young. Um, then you have Dana, Dana sorry, uh, Amber Balkin, Tony Bridinger. And of course, uh, uh, Isabella Robusto. Now, I, for me, I wasn't very familiar with Isabella myself. Uh, you know, there was a lot of people hyping her debut. And personally, for me, I was not very familiar with her. Uh, apparently, she was on the late model scene. She got into a very nasty crash last year and got a severe concussion. I had heard about that. I had seen the crash, but I, I didn't get I don't really follow the late model scene that much. So I didn't really know who she was. I, I, I knew she was a race car driver. I follow her, I follow her on Twitter and you know all that crap. So I knew who she was, but I really didn't know much of her background. And boy, did we we saw plenty of Isabella tonight. God damn, she she was a rocket ship tonight for you know kind of what we all expected her to do. But uh no, nonetheless, 43 cars were entered. It was gonna be interesting on how we did qualifying because like we mentioned on last week's podcast. 32 cars would get in on speed and four cars from each division, four from the West and four from the main would get the provisionals. And in my opinion, that's kind of the best way ARCA could have done this. It's the most fair. I don't think there's any other way they could have done it that would have made it fair for both divisions, you know, because they have the 32 cars. If you're in on speed, you're in on speed, but that way both sets of series get uh, provisionals for each series. So, I do commend ARCA for how they did the qualifying procedure. I think they nailed it. I think it was fair. Um, you know, at the end of the day, some people, they still want the old school fastest 40. And you know what? I can understand that too. I can, believe me. I can understand the fastest 40. But, you know, sometimes, and again, you can blame you can blame Richard Petty for it because that's what started this many, many years ago when they stopped, when they started to use owner's points because Petty was starting to DNQ. Um but yeah, in some ways, the fastest 40 would be nice, and it really would have radically changed our DNQ list had they uh, taken the fastest 40 uh, versus the top 32 plus provisionals. So when we started on, um, obviously on Friday, all action on Friday, one day show. Uh, some interesting stories that I did want to talk about before we do get to practice, though. Uh, Brad Smith, obviously, we had talked about him Uh very special story. I didn't even know about this um, until they had gotten to the track. So Brad, obviously, as we know, his motor is being rebuilt from Daytona. Severe severe damage was done to it. Luckily, it's salvageable. It's not totaled. Um, but that was Brad's primary motor for the year. And so Brad didn't really have anything lined up. He did not have a new, he didn't want to, you know, jeopardize the motor for Phoenix. He didn't really know what he was going to have lined up. But where Brad gets his practice tires from, well, I should say Brad buys the practice tires from Rev Racing. Obviously, if you get practice tires, they're a discounted price. So they give Brad a good deal. And to me, this really shows just how much of a family uh, the, Arca Garage, the Arca Garage truly is. Um, Rev Racing brought a car to Phoenix just for Brad to run some practice laps so he could get his attempts. And that that's really nice of Max Siegel and Rev Racing to do that for him. They did not they did not have to do that for him. You know, they could have just you know, they could have just said sorry and you know, Brad would have unfortunately had to skip and if he would have done that, he would have lost his bonus money. And Brad, I'm telling you guys, Brad needs that bonus money at the end of the year and weekly for travel and hotels and all that crap. That's how Brad can afford to do this every week. But uh 
So I commend Rev Racing for doing that for me. That was very nice. They were not going to run the full race. They were not even going to probably start and park. Had Brad made the race, he was literally just going to run the pace laps and park it. So, but I wanted to talk about that first and give a commend to Rev Racing uh, for just doing that for Brad. Very, very nice. Um, but Brad did get out on track. All 43 cars did make a lap. Um, some cars only made a few laps. Like I said, going back to Brad, he did get out on track, but I don't know if it was just because of a car he wasn't used to or what was the case, but Brad actually spun in practice. Brad Smith actually spun, uh, probably flat spot of the tires. So the only tires he really had to use, they were pretty much screwed now. So, but it counted as a practice lap. So, heh, you know, Brad, probably his life flashed before his eyes. I'm like, oh God, he couldn't afford to tear that car up. And then David Smith on his very first practice lap backed it into the wall very hard. Uh, luckily, the 05 team did have a backup car. They were getting the backup car ready. Um, it was kind of unclear. Obviously, with no TV, we don't know exactly what happened to David Smith. All we know is, is that something happened. He backed it into the wall and obviously needed a backup car. Uh, you know, David Smith, tough old kook. You know, he's no, no young guy. David Smith in his mid-70s now. So, you know, any hits you see like that he takes, man, I told you he's one tough guy. Would not mess with him. Um, but yeah, uh, everyone else did get on time for a lap. You know, guys, like, even like I said, Bobby Hillis, Alex club, uh, Brayton Laster and, uh, Brad Perez were starting parks. Um, like I said, the guys up at front, who would you expect to be faster, fastest in practice, but William Sawal, it's the only guy to crack the 130 mile per hour mark in practice, which again, just shows you just how much more. I mean, like I said, to give you guys an instance, I mean, William Swatch and Giovanni Ruggiero or Gio Ruggiero, I mean, they're, they were four tenths faster than second place. I mean, it, or than third place, I should say. It's just, I mean, that's amazing that two cars, those two cars can manage to be that much quicker than the field. And then it's funny because then you look at the rest of the field. Third, Sean Hingarani, who was third driving for uh, um, Hattori. You look at third through 10th. And that's only separated by three tenths of a second from third to tenth. Meanwhile, first to third is four tenths of a second. That's weird. I mean, again, it just shows you, man, there's so many competitive teams in the series. There really is. There's more competitive teams than people really think. The problem is you've got those two elite cars, the 18 and the 20, that just overshadow that every single week. When if you really look at it, there's a lot more competitiveness in the series. They just don't have I just, the secrets, the smarts, or the setups that the 18 and the 20 team do. I mean, you look at those setups. I mean, those cars, the camber setups on those cars are ridiculous. And I love that part. I love the fact of how crazy those cars are all set up. And that's just the most, the more fun part of the Arca series is that you can do those kinds of unique setups. It's not outlawed like it is. I'm um, in the top three divisions. It's not necessarily outlawed, but I don't think the officials really like it, so to say. But yeah, William Swalch was quickest in practice. Gio Ruggiero was second. Uh, like I said, Sean Hingarani in his new ride in the 61 was third. Um, other notables, Chris Wright, full-time driver. He was the highest full-time driver in the main division um, in practice in fourth. Uh, Andres Perez was seventh. Uh, Tony Bradinger was ninth. And Lavar Scott was 11th. So your Greg Van Oss was down in 19th. Christian Rose was 16th. Um, Amber Balkin was down in 22nd, I believe. And then, of course, Alex Club was down in 40th, and I think Brad was 43rd. So I think those are your full-time drivers in the main division. Uh, the highest full-time driver in the West Series was Tyler Reif, and he was 6th. And then it was Jack Wood in 8th, and then... Todd, no, not Todd Sousa, Eric Johnson Jr. in 15th. So, like I said, the West guys definitely had the speed, but you could just kind of tell that they were not, they, they had speed, but they were not going to be able to compete with those top main series cars. It just wasn't going to happen. Um, so then we get to qualifying, man, the big qualifying session. Um, and it was a one, the way they did it, the way the Arca series kind of did it was quite unique, I would say. Uh, 
where it was a 20 minute time session. You could go out whenever you wanted. You were not forced to go out early. You could wait whenever you wanted. Uh, you were allowed to go out one time for as long as you wanted. You know, like you, you could make as many laps as you wanted, um, but you're only allowed to go out one time. Uh, but obviously nobody ran more than five laps because at a track like Phoenix where tire wear is pretty good. Um, after a lap or two, your tires are pretty much shot. You're not going to go any faster, especially in these cars. So, uh, you saw about the average was two to three laps that people would make before they would pull off. Um, and there was a lot of pickup, but once again, nobody was going to beat that 18. Unshockingly, William Swalich, he did win the poll, but he only did win the poll by, about eight hundredths of a second. I mean, Sean Hingarani in second place, definitely, they definitely closed the gap on the 18. But still, no, I just, we all kind of knew no one was going to beat him. Um, some standouts that actually were able to make the show on time that maybe some of us did not expect. Um, you know, mainly Brad Perez. I mean, not, not, not because he's not a bad driver, but just because of the fact that that was a start and park entry. You know, Brad Perez in a start and park entry still manages to qualify on time. It shows you really how talented he is. I had actually predicted the 63 of John R. Mendy to miss the race. So uh, the fact that he timed in, that shed a lot, too. Um, yeah, that said a lot, too. Uh, John Borneman, the third, he timed in. Um, you know, Joe Farr, the 24, he timed in. Uh, there was def definitely, like I said, some people that we did not expect to time in and would have to maybe take a provisional. They actually timed in. Now, the cars that were outside the top 33 or the top 32 were Danica Dart, Garrett Zacharias, Cody Dennison, Cody Camille, uh, Keemley. Sorry, I'm sorry if I'm botching that name. I'm trying my best. Alex Club, Brayton Laster, Ryan Roulette, Michael Maples, Bobby Hillis Jr., uh, Brad Smith, and David Smith. Now, obviously, Brad and David Smith did not take uh, qualifying runs as David's car was still being worked on. Uh, David's backup car was still being worked on. And Brad, well, the plan really was not to take a qualifying lap. So uh, the four cars that got the provisionals from the main division side were uh, the 0-3, uh, in no particular order, but it was the 0-3, 10, 12, and 99. So three, eight, uh, Andy Hillenberg, actually not the zero three. I'm sorry, not the zero three. Uh, it was the 10, 12, 99. It was a 10, 12, 99. Who was it? Man, I can't, oh, I'm sorry guys off the top of my head. I had this memorized 10, 12, 99, 10, 12, 99. Dang it. Sorry, guys. Hang on a second. Let me look through the let me look through the official report. I'm sorry. I thought I had this memorized. I'm sorry, guys. I'm sorry. Um, yeah, that so the 99, the 10, the 12. Was it the zero three at the zero? I thought the zero three was on the west side of provisionals. Um, but then the, the west provisionals went to the 05, 07, 27, and 77. So then that would have meant the 03 got okay. So the 03 did get in on the main division side because originally the 32 of Christian Rose's time had not registered. So it actually looked like Christian Rose's car would have to take a main series provisional. That gave a West Series provisional to the 03 of Alex Club. So when Christian Rose's time eventually was then added to uh, be in the field, uh the provisional stayed the same. The 07 was still in and the uh, 03 was still in, so the provisionals didn't really change, but those were your provisionals. Unfortunately, that left out uh, Cody Dennison, who unfortunately DNQs two straight races, so I feel bad for my buddy Cody. That's got to suck. I feel for him. Garrett Zacharias, you know, he tried his best with an SB2. Obviously, an SB2, you know, is it, it's manageable at Phoenix, but it's not easy, and unfortunately, I believe they were still 34th. I mean, they were close. They were definitely close. They gave it their best shot, but uh, it's two straight DNQs for Cody, and it's two straight DNQs for Rise, man. So that's a that's a tough way to start their seasons. And obviously, Brad Smith uh, would miss the show too, but that was kind of expected. Um, this was just kind of a get through attempt to get through Talladega and beyond. Um, but yeah, man, I, I don't know when was the last time we had an ARCA race without a Peterson entry and a Brad Smith entry in the field together. I mean, it's got to be back to the 90s. 
was the last time we did not have either a Peterson or a Brad Smith car in the field. It's unbelievable. It was, it just didn't feel right. Anyway, I mean, I'm, I'm being serious with you guys. It just did not feel right. Not having a Peterson car or a Brad Smith car in the field, but you know, that, that's how racing goes sometimes, you know? And I mean, P Dennison did a great job too. I mean, it's just a matter of old tires. And again, SB2 motor, you know, it's just, it has a horsepower reduction. If that was an Ilmore, they probably would have made the race on time because they wouldn't have had the horsepower restriction. Same thing goes for the 31. That stupid horsepower restriction is what's, it's just what's hurting them. So nonetheless, we had our field started and we had the race, uh, was all ready to go. I was going to do a live stream, but I couldn't quite get it ready to go. So unfortunately we had to abandon that. Uh, we get the race going green and in less than 20 seconds, we had our first crash. So. And I literally feel for these guys. I mean, just imagine putting all that work and effort together and your car gets demolished. That's, that's the one thing about these ARCA crashes, man. It's like, it's so weird in this series. And I love this series, but it, I've noticed this. Whenever we crash, like we don't just have a minor crash. We like just demolish cars. I've always noticed that about this series. And kind of like modern day NASCAR, there's no like small crashes. You just completely demolish the car, it feels like. Um... It felt like now the 05 of David Smith did start the race. Some people were saying there might have been fluid coming out of the car because obviously, I mean, the, it was a brand new backup car. It hadn't even ran a lap yet. Um, you know, and I don't know if that was the case, but it just looked like going into the corner that the 07 and the 77, they just couldn't slow down. I mean, it's like they lit, and then there's, I think the 77 piled into the 99. It's like they just couldn't get slowed down. I don't blame the 77 or the 07 or the 99. It's like they just could not slow down. It's like there was there had to have been fluid on the track because they legit went into turn one and either the brakes were gone or they hit fluid because the cars legitimately did not slow down until they hit the wall. That's why the, both the 07 and the 77 were just demolished. They literally went into that corner and hit the wall at over 120 miles per hour. The 99... You know, poor Michael Maples, man. It's welcome to Arkham, Michael Maples. <laughs> I love, I like Michael. Met him at Daytona, a nice guy. But man, welcome to Arca. He's, he's kind of had a rough go at the start. You know, he crashed at Daytona and uh, crashed here early, which just kind of killed his race. I mean, the car obviously wasn't good at all for the rest of the race because of all the damage. But you know, he he limped at home at least. But man, it was, uh, definitely for uh, five flags. A lot of guys like Dennison and Maples want to build some more momentum for sure. Uh, but yeah, unfortunately, we had two cars that were going to run the whole race out early. So that sucked. Um, especially for Danica, as she was one of the four uh, women in the field. Uh, Brayton Laster and Brad Perez, were they were the primary start in parks. Uh, they pulled off early. Brad at 14 laps and Brayton at 17 laps. Uh, Bobby Hillis Jr. didn't think he would be a start in park, and it didn't sound like he was, but nonetheless, they parked the car after 27 or 24 laps. Um, some other odd DNFs. We had Joe Farr. He only ran 32 laps, but he had sponsorship. He ran plenty of practice laps. He was not a start in park. I think he legit had electrical problems. And same thing with the 63, the 63 of John R. Mendia. Uh, overheating issues after 34 laps. I doubt that was a start and park. There's no way they would make the trip out there um, to do a start and park. That'd be dumb for them. So I think they had a legit overheating problem. Johnny Borman the third actually did hit the wall in practice. They repaired the car to go do a practice or a qualifying lap. Uh, he was in and out of the garage all night. Uh, I think he made six laps and then he went to the garage. Then he came back out, went back to the garage, came back out, went back to the garage. Yeah, it was definitely a long night for Johnny Borneman um, and that team. Uh, but yeah, getting back to the actual race, just wanted to go over some of the cars that had DNF'd early. Uh, we got back going green. William Swalich obviously takes the lead, um, but not for long. Within the first nine laps of the of the next run, the 20 car of Gio Ruggiero actually ran him down. And it's something I definitely did not expect to see. I Honestly, I thought when that 18 car got out front, um, you're happy as left, right? I don't doubt you, Cody. I don't doubt you, Cody. Especially you got out of there before the rain hit. So I don't I don't blame you there. I don't blame you there. Um, but I definitely did not expect the 20 car to just run down the 18 like that. That one thing that does tell me we are in for one heck of an East Series championship battle. 
those two guys are going to go for that East Series championship like crazy. So it might actually bring some intrigue to the ARCA East Series, which honestly it desperately needs. It desperately needs that. So I can say five flags in a couple weeks, that's going to be a fun one. Um, but uh, no, the 20 car ran the 18 down and he he passed him. I mean, it's one thing to pass the, you know, the, the 18 car, catch the 18 car, but passing he actually did that. So Gio took the lead. Um, the 18, that kind of stabilized um, up front. You know, meanwhile, man, it's like Is Isabella was like the class of the field. She started sixth, got up to fifth, got up to fourth, and then got up to third. It was just like, wow, we, we don't usually see that. I mean, I haven't seen that since the days of Shauna Robinson. I mean, you know, respect to Tony Bridinger, but she hasn't like gone up to the top five yet consistently um, without some help. Um, but she, I mean, she, she was running good herself in the top 10, but like this is uh, Isabella who, you know, who, who I wasn't really familiar with and wasn't really familiar with to a lot of people. There she is right there running third and actually running like lap times right at the same of where the 18 and the 20 were running. I mean, it was really unbelievable to see. And like that, I have not seen that since the days of Shauna Robinson. I wasn't even alive when Shauna Robinson was in ARCA. But I remember watching those races uh, with my grandfather on tape like years later because my grandfather has a huge VHS collection of ARCA races from the past. So he has like the whole 2000 season on VHS of ARCA. And we we watched them together. And I just, I watched Shauna Robinson and it's like, wow, I, I, that was very impressive to see Isabella just go up there. Now, sure, she was in a Venerini car. You can say that. But at the end of the day, we have seen many women struggle in the Venerini cars. If I'm my personal opinion, the two best women that we have seen in Venerini cars, uh, it would be it actually, I would say Tony and I would say Isabella, even though we've only seen Isabella in one race. This performance was unbelievable by her. Just makes me wish what if we saw Johanna Long in a Venerini car? Johanna Long, man. One of the greatest female talents that never got a real chance, in my opinion. God, it's amazing how people still talk about her to this day, wishing she got more of a chance in NASCAR and how she took a mid-pack Xfinity team to great runs. But obviously, we're not here to talk about Johanna. Um, but yeah, Tony, she was doing a great job in the top 10. Um, Isabella was doing a great job in the top five. I believe it was International Women's Day on that Friday. So obviously Jamie little, the commentator was hyping the crap out of them and rightfully so. Um, I'll say this, Sean Hingarani probably ran one of the more cleaner races of his life. And I can actually respect that. Maybe he's cleaned himself up finally. It's about freaking time, but maybe Sean Hingarani is actually going to do good and not run like an idiot out there. Who knows? Um, one thing I was curious about how the West series teams were ever going to bring it to them. Grant Enfinger, obviously his experience at Phoenix did help a lot. He ran top five consistently the entire race, but you could tell he just didn't have the speed to contend with the top two. Um, guys like Jack Wood, guys like Hingarani, um, which, I mean, can you really consider Hingarani a West entry considering, even though he's a West driver, he's, I mean, that's more of a main series team because Hattori's on the East Coast where the other guys are. So I guess you could say like the, the 16 car, uh, which is on the West Coast, the 13 car, which is on the West Coast. Those were arguably the two best West Series, actual West Series entries um, to at least start the race. A lot of the rest of them kind of just ran mid-pack, which is what they normally do, kind of what they normally do. Um, and, I, you know, that's the one thing I do hate. I, I really wish those guys on the West Coast could bring it harder, bring it harder to the uh, – main series guys like we did see last year with Tyler Reif and the uh, Loden Jackson team pulling off that extreme upset. Uh, but the race continued on uh, for a good 50 laps. Uh, Gio was leading comfortably, man, until we had our next big crash. Um, you know, poor David Smith, man. And this, this crash was kind of sad to see, but uh, David Smith, he was running out there. Um, obviously many laps down. I think it was only, I think it was only four though. Um, but he was just trying to get out there in his backup car, just trying to finish the race. Now, from what it originally appeared, it looked like that the 19 of Eric Johnson Jr. just absolutely piled into the 05, wrecked him, and then, unfortunately, the 88 was collected along with it. But uh, Eric Johnson Jr. was kind enough to reach out to my tweet, which I posted about him. And I guess, apparently, David Smith was trying to get out of the way, and the reaction time was too fast. 
And I mean, you could say it was an accident. I, I'm sure it was. It wasn't intentional, obviously. Um, but the 05 nonetheless got it, uh, was taken out by the 19, not on purpose, just kind of a crash that was inevitable. And I feel bad for Jake Bowman. Jake Bowman was running top 15 at the time, really doing a solid job. That was actually the same exact car that Dylan Capello had won with at the bull ring last year. So it was a good piece. It really was a good piece. Probably one of the best cars that Kluwer had in the shop. Uh, Naki Kluwer had. And unfortunately, uh, that car was toast. And David Smith's car was toast. Two cars, man, toast for David Smith. It's uh, You know, you talk about these teams not having enough money to repair their cars. Well, I think... I think David Smith, the owner of Shockwave, when I think if not, he's not the owner, one of the part owners um, of Shockwave, I'm sure he'll have plenty of money to get his stuff fixed for sure. But nonetheless, you still hate to see crash cars, um, especially for team a team like Naki who really can't afford to repair their stuff very well. But at least David Smith does have them. I'm, I wouldn't be shocked with the money that David Smith has. I, it wouldn't shock me if he actually rep helps repair the 88 car too, just because he feels bad. It wouldn't shock me if he helps out with those repairs. He's got the money. We know, I mean, when you're the owner of Shockwave, that kind of money he's got there, he's got the money for it. So uh, that interrupted though, Geo's gap. Uh, for some reason, we literally ran one lap. Uh, we were going to run a couple laps until the stage break. We ran one lap. Greg Van Ellis went for a spin in turn two. Luckily, nobody hit him. Um, and then for some reason, we ran one more lap under green, which didn't make any sense. Um, it was under this switch where William Swalich got back by Gio Ruggiero on the restart. Definitely looked like William Swalich was playing restart games with Gio. I think there were some of those restarts where I feel like William may have jumped or just played some unnecessary games to get the lead. Um, but nonetheless, uh, we had our scheduled break. Um, unfortunately, after this, it just felt like the race really couldn't get going because, well, weather was coming. Uh, we got back going green again on lap 81. Gio actually beat the leader to the start-finish line on the green flag, so he actually got credit with leading that lap. Uh, but William would get the lead back. And unfortunately, it was clear that the 20 car and cars like the 55 were long-run cars. So those cars took time to come in. We had only had a 10-lap run before the 34 of Isaac Johnson went for a spin. Then we got back going green again. We only ran 16 more laps. It was actually during those 16 laps where we saw lightning flashes. You know, I mean, it was actually kind of cool. I mean, in some photos, I'm sure you can find them if you look hard enough, there's actually photos of the cars on the track, and you can see lightning way, way in the distance. Now, of course, I think NASCAR's lightning monitors what? eight miles and this lightning strike was nine miles. I think that's how it works. Um, so obviously they weren't going to stop the race, uh, but they did have that lightning strike. So they did stop the race after 100, um, 112 laps, uh, running four laps under yellow. Uh, they officially brought the cars down because they have to hold them for 30 minutes. And unfortunately in that 30 minutes, the rain came, which was expected. I mean, it's just, we're in the desert, but man, if you ever need weather, I mean, if, if if you're a town or a place in a drought, you can't get rain to save your life, book a NASCAR race. You will have the floodgates opened up for you. I don't know what NASCAR did to piss off the rain, guys, but man, even in the desert, we can't escape rain. It's, it's, uh, it, it, it's, it's, it's something. Oh boy. All right. Yeah, I right, buy. Huh. It's frustrating, trust me, especially when you're in Phoenix of all places. Um, but nonetheless, William Swatch was declared the winner. Kind of an anticlimactic ending. He was my pick to win the race. I mean, we I, I figured we, he kind of was gonna win. Maybe it would have been nice to see what the 20 could have done or the 23 could have done. Um, you know, or or Mosek. I mean, the 28 was actually made a valiant run up to fourth, but uh yeah, kind of an anticlimactic finish, but William Sawalich wins yet again. Hard to believe it's in, you know, you think of how much the kid has won, but this is actually only William Sawalich's uh, fifth um, Arkham Menard Series victory um, of his 14 starts. He's only won five times. It's kind of hard to believe. You, you'd think he actually would have won more than that, but um, he's won five times in the uh, main division, 
two times in the East Division standalones, I believe, right? Two or three times in the standalones. And then he actually has a West Series victory. Um, and that was the 20, uh, 23 uh, final finale race. So he's got victories now in all three divisions of ARCA. So let's see. That's one. That's three. So he's got eight total ARCA wins. So this is, um, so I guess to say, this was the eighth total win of William Sawalich's ARCA career. So it's hard to believe he's only won eight of them. I figured, you know, with how much you see him running up front, you'd think he'd win like 10 now. But no, he's only got eight wins total. Um, Gio Rosero was second. Like I said, that E-Series championship battle is going to be a lot of fun. Uh, Grand Endfinger, it was, you know, it's kind of a shame. And I, and I put this tweet out. I get it. You know, I get it. Isabella was doing a great job and I get it. Tony was doing a great job, but I really wish the commentators had focused on other stories in the field. I understand, you know, like I said, Isabella was having a career run. It was an amazing run by her, not taking anything away from that 10 out of 10 effort for her and another top 10 finish for Tony Bringer. I mean, two great runs, but you could have talked about something else throughout the race. We barely heard anything about the points championship for the main division. We didn't hear jack crap about the main uh, the points championship in the West division. Um, did they even mention that Greg Van Els was the points leader? I mean, if they did, it was only when he spun. Um, I don't even think they mentioned Christian Rose's name at all. Um, like, do more to highlight the field. I mean, we didn't even, and, you know, the reason why I bring it up for, uh, you know, Grand Endfinger, I mean, Talk about the history behind that ride and that number and the significance of that. You know, Spencer Clark, who you know was tragically killed at age 19, the meaning behind that number 23, you know, the meaning of running Phoenix, the West Sears, and what it means to the, you know, the Gallagher family, the, you know, um, what the number means, that big story, man, like that would have been really, really good for, you know, the commentators to talk about. And it's just like, man, the opportunity's right there. And they just didn't do it. And it, it was kind of frustrating, man, not seeing them really discuss any stories other than like two to three. They didn't really branch away. Oh, hit my microphone. But they didn't really branch away from any stories other than um, Isabella, Tony, and the top two. It was just pretty much them the whole race. And it's like, you got the story of the 23 car there, man. You know, talk about some of the West Series guys like Jack. I mean, they mentioned Jack Wood for like 10 seconds, but talk more about him. Talk more about Tyler Reif. You know, talk, just talk more instead of the two to three stories that they did. It was a little frustrating, man. And then you got Jamie Little's amazing commentary. I, again, try to be nice, man, but she's just, she's just not very good. 10 out of 10 pit reporter. 10 out of 10 pit reporter is uh, Jamie Little. Commentator, not so much. And I'm, I'm going to keep saying that. It's not a criticism. It's just being honest. And a lot of people agree with that. Exactly. I agree. Go through the field. Just go through the field. Exactly. Right there, Cody in the chat. Go through the field. Talk about each car. That too. They didn't do that. You know, I mean, it's it's it, it, it's fine. You got time, you know. You don't have to focus on the 18 every single lap. You don't have to focus on the 55 every single lap. Because it was it was fun in the beginning. It was. It was fun in the beginning. But then when they kept doing it at like lap 75 or lap, lap 80, I'm like, okay, let's, let's calm down here, you know. But again, I'm not trying to take anything away from Isabella and Tony's great runs. They did a great job. But you could have focused on more stuff, too. So, but it's nonetheless, like I said, uh, Isabella, unfortunately, uh, fell out of the top five. She ended up sixth. Still a great run for her. Um, Tony ended up ninth. A good run for her as well. Um, not the strongest performance out of the Rev Racing cars this weekend. Only eighth and tenth. Um, Chris Wright didn't crash. Let's give a, let's give a good uh, clap to Chris Wright. He has me blocked, by the way, so I don't care. But I don't know. He might see this, but. Let's give a slight golf clap to Chris Wright for not crashing. That's an accomplishment. Um, Amber Balkin, uh, she she didn't crash either. Let's give another slight golf clap. Slight golf clap to Amber Balkin for not crashing too. So, hey, we're making progress here. We're making progress. 
Um, <laughs> uh, Greg Van Ous managed to recover from his spin to uh, finish 13th, so still a decent run for him. Um, in terms of the West Series guys, Sean Hingarani, 5th, uh, Jack Wood, 7th, and Tyler Reif was 11th. Uh, Connor Mosek, I mean, for as much crap as we give Connor Mosek, he didn't crash either. Another golf clap. Another golf clap for Connor Mosek. He didn't crash. Fourth place for the Pinnacle team. So good run there. Um, like I said, Christian Rose was 16th. Um, Trevor Hudson was 17th. Kyle Keller, 18th. Um, Eric Johnson Jr., 20th. Marco Andretti, he kind of struggled. And I think it's definitely going to be a struggle for Marco Andretti. That's why I'm kind of happy that Marco is running. Um, that's why I'm kind of happy Marco is running such a variety of racetracks is that you can really tell this is going to be a learning experience for Marco. You know, I mean, he's only ran, I think, a handful of truck races. What, two? Two truck races coming into this? So he doesn't have a lot of NASCAR experience. And I think putting instead of putting him in trucks, putting him in ARCA, I think is just a better fit. It, it will allow him to learn more and not get taken out by, you know, the people in the truck series. I think ARCA is actually a better fit for him for now, even though he is running some truck races. But, yeah. Um, but, yeah, other notables in the field, uh, like I said, that did crash out. Um, we do have uh, Club. Club did uh, – Fail to finish. He had a mechanical problem. His old SB2 gave out uh, oil pressure. So tough break for Alex Club, too. They had some uh, mechanical failures on their truck. I think the entire right front pretty much disintegrated on that truck after hitting a pothole. So I, I believe Alex is still stuck in New, New Mexico, I think. So I feel for him. Hopefully they can get home soon. Andy Jankowiak had a tire let go early and just could not recover from a green flag pit stop. A green flag pit stop at Phoenix is a death sentence with how long that pit road is. Um, Isaac Johnson couldn't recover from his spin after losing a couple laps. And like I said, Michael Maples, just all the damage to his car, it just made for a long day, but he uh, at least brought it home in 29th. So uh, like I said, though, the race was overall – just not not the best, not bad, but not the best ARCA race at Phoenix. We've seen, last year's ARCA race, like for instance, last year's ARCA race at Phoenix was better than this by a lot. It really was. Um, I would say though that this was better than last year's West Race uh, finale, um, but still not the best. I'll give it six point five out of ten. So, um, our point standings coming out of this one. Now this is full time. Um, drivers standings in main Arca. So this is going to be split into two, um, split into two, uh, full-time driver standings out of race two. Greg Van Els, uh, holds the points lead. This is full-time drivers, 73 points. Christian Rose is in second. He is minus five. He is tied with Andres Perez de Lara at also minus five. Amber Balkan is in fourth minus nine. LeVar Scott is fifth minus 10. Even though Andy Jankowiak has not officially announced full-time, he would like to run full-time, so we have him included right now. He is sixth minus 22. Alex Club is seventh minus 23. Tony Bridinger is um, eighth minus 31. Chris Wright is uh, ninth minus 35. Michael Maples is 10th minus 35 as well. Caleb Costner is 11th minus 45. And Brad Smith is 12th minus 48, which is ironic because Brad drives 48. Um, I will tell you right there, though, you know, for all the for Chris Wright, man, I don't know if he's going to make that up. You know, Talladega, if Chris Wright cannot make up any points at Talladega, man, that might eliminate him from the championship right there, man. I don't think he's going to gain that many points. But I definitely think we are in for a unique ARCA points championship battle this year. You know, it could really go to any one of these guys. It could go to Greg Van Alst. It could go to Christian Rose. It could go to Perez. It could go to Scott. I, I don't think Balkan's going to – sorry, all due respect to Balkan. I don't think she's got a shot. Um, I would say Jen has got a shot if they he was confirmed to run full-time. But right now we just don't know. But I think Bridinger, Bridinger is unfortunately too far behind. I think Chris Wright's too far behind. 
Um, and same thing with Costner and Maples. They're just they're just too far behind because they had a tough couple of races to start the season. Um, but yeah, still a pretty interesting championship battle. Uh, if Greg Van Ellis could pull off the championship win, that'd be great. That'd be awesome. Um, but, uh, you know, Christian Rose, he might shock the field this year, and I hope he gets a win. So we'll, we'll have to see, but it'll be a fun main series championship battle. The West Series championship right now, obviously they finally got the points updated. Right now it's William Sawalich in first. Um, obviously it just goes by the results of what we got in the race. William Sawalich is first, but again, he's not full-time. Gio Rogero was second, but he's not full-time. Ryan Enfinger's third, but he's not full-time. You know what I'm trying to say here. By technicality right now, first place in the West Series circuit would be Sean Hingarani. Now, he's not confirmed to run full-time West, but he's going to run the majority of the schedule. And I could see them, depending on how he is in the championship, I could see Sean Hingarani going for the West Series championship again if he is in contention for it. Is that if that makes sense? I could see Sean going for it because he's got the money to do it, but I don't think they want to go for it 100% unless they have a shot at the championship. So, uh, in terms of full time drivers for the West Circuit, Sean Hingarani would be first uh, as of now with 39. Uh, Jack Wood is in second, minus two. Uh, Tyler Reif is third, minus six. Uh, Trevor Huddleston is first. Fourth minus 10. Uh, Kyle Keller is fourth minus 11. And Eric Johnson Jr. is fifth minus 15. So that's your West Series championship right there. Obviously, starting with the next race, when the East Field, well, the East Field, the West Series field condensed back down to the field size that we're normally used to, that's when we're really going to be able to discuss who has got the championship level speed right there. But, uh, yeah, yeah, like I said, guys, uh, we got some fun championship battles. I think the most exciting thing that we can really take out of this weekend was that the champions in the uh, both or all three East, Main, and West. I think the best news is right now, guys, we cannot predict the champion, and that's always a good thing. We cannot predict the champion in East. We cannot predict the champion in Maine, and we cannot predict the champion in West. I love that. I love how all three championships this year are open for grabs. You know, for everyone who just handed the 18 another E-Series title, I'm telling you, after what we saw at Phoenix, I think Gio is going to give William a run for his money. Because Gio, Gio's good, man. He's won at Winchester. Um, I think he's won features at Five Flags. He knows how to drive. Gio's no slouch. He also ran over Stephen Nassie's father, which was, I think that happened last year. I don't know why. I just instantly thought of that again. But, uh, um, yeah, so Gio's good, man. Gio is good. And I think he's going to give William a run for his money. So we're in for a fun season, but I'm telling you guys, I think we're in for more 18 and 20 car battles. So hopefully you like that and get ready for it. Um, the next ARCA race in general is coming up in a couple weeks at Five Flags, the E-Series season opener. This is one of their few standalone dates, so probably don't expect more than maybe 15 to 20 cars. Um, the next main series ARCA race will be at Talladega in April. And the next West Series race, I don't even know when that is. I haven't checked the West Series schedule in a long time, but let's just say there's another one. We know there's another one. I, I don't remember it off the top of my head, guys, but... There is another West Series race, and it's coming It's coming in a couple weeks, couple months. I don't know. That's not my Dang it. I'm sorry. <laughs> Whew. But anyway, guys, I'm going to get out of here. Uh, not much else to talk about. Oh, I guess never mind. Uh, I'll be doing my Salem supercar test with the Kimmels uh, next Wednesday uh, at Salem Speedway. So I'm really excited for that. Chasing the dream, man. It's... Um, you know, it's one thing to drive one of those Salem supercar stock cars, but it'll be something for, uh, it'll be something if I can really strap into an ARCA car at Iowa Speedway in June. So that's what we're hoping for, guys. So uh, donate to the GoFundMe. Uh, if you guys can find it, it's under Colby Evans Racing. If you want to go donate to the GoFundMe, it'd be much appreciated. And um, yeah, hopefully we can make it happen. So till next time, guys, I will see you. I will see you uh, on Thursday with the Backmarker Battle Show. 
lot to talk about there from Phoenix, and we will be previewing Bristol. So uh, till then, take care. Have a good rest of your Tuesday night. I've been Colby Evans, starting Park Car, giving you guys a goodbye salute, and I'll see you all uh, next time. Goodbye.